So it's my great pleasure to introduce Professor Telemann from Berkeley. So he will give us a talk about the curved cotton complex revisited. Thank you very much for inviting me here. Um, I, I remember all this, this conference are always very interesting and also very pleasant. In fact, I remember a conference um, three years ago in Moscow in happier times where I learned a lot of things. Um, I think I talked about Cologne branches back then as well. And um, um, I'm assuming that everybody in the audience knows exactly what I said because I plan to pick up with exactly where I left off. Okay, that was my attempt at humor. Sorry, I, I promised with my last joke because uh, any others would probably be worse. Um, all right, so uh, so I want to talk about something I've been discussing for a long, long time from many points of view. Well, maybe the same point of view that but where pieces didn't fit together very well. And I think there's some progress in understanding how they do fit together. I try to explain that. And the topic is current again because. 3D mirror symmetry and uh, and uh, Coulomb branches, as they are called, I think we begin to understand what they are, are becoming fashionable in mathematics. And uh, especially in the case of gauge theory, I think we have a good uh, good angle at, at that, just from um, what we understand about group actions on categories. So categories, topological group action, I think are a mathematical formulation of boundary theories for gauge theory in three dimensions. If I just said topological gauge theory, it would be almost tautological, but for reasons which at least to me are not so clear, the gauge theory that seems to go with that in physics, n equals four supersymmetric gauge theory. And the topological side corresponds to the A model of the mystery 3D mirror symmetry. And it's the A side in the sense that boundary conditions for this are coming from a two-dimensional A models, which can be gauged and specifically G Hamiltonian spaces are the main example. And three-dimensional mirror symmetry, whatever it is, it should, that's a requirement, should see two-dimensional mirror symmetry on its boundary, on its boundary condition. So in particular, the mirror of a gauged A model, such as G Hamiltonian space, should appear. So if you start the gauge A model, the G Hamiltonian space, it should have a mirror, as a complex space, and that complex space should appear somehow in the 3D mirror of pure gauge theory. So whatever it is, want to call the 3D mirror, you should see the uh, complex mirror of a G manifold on that one. So what we extract from here is there should be a holomorphic mirror picture of 3D gauge theory. And here you can be a bit specific. Uh, this should be a rosansky witten theory. That's what uh, I think physicists tell us. And second, mirrors of G variety should appear as boundary theories for that. So all this is true, and in many cases, it's actually explicit computation. So in the case of flag varieties, one can show that the reach mirrors of flag varieties give a complete foliation, in fact, of the Coulomb branch of 3D theory that I'll talk about. I will not talk about that. It's somewhat older work, a very old work, actually. The second one is uh, that can be made very explicit is the gauge linear sigma model. And it has a fairly trivial part that's very old and the more interesting part that's, uh, that's uh, interesting, I guess, because it's no more, more novel and connects to recent understanding of Coulomb branches. And I should also say it's a K-theory version and I understand it very well, I think, in part two and uh, to my shame, I still didn't work out part one very well. So in fact, uh, uh, um, to be a bit cheeky about that, this, all this was in fact formulated before 3D mirror symmetry became a thing in mathematics. It's actually implicit in the work of Gibbon, Dalkim and Lee. They didn't spell it out. Some of the language wasn't there and the complete picture certainly wasn't there. Uh, so one could say, as I said, a little bit cheekily, as I said, this post dicts. Because actually all of this was certainly, uh, I wouldn't say it was, uh, 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 spelled out conjecturally before 3D mirror symmetry came up in physics, but but uh, it certainly was spelled out before math mathematicians were talking about the subject. Um, and but going back to the working Roman Witten theory, oops, uh, we already know the mirror of 3D theory. It is a total space of a total integrable system on the Langlands dual group. That's uh, 
That's a 3D mirror. So let's recall what that is. When the torus case particularly is just a cotangent bundle of the dual torus, uh, and it projects with the cotangent fiber, the Lie algebra, the cotangent fiber with complex tori as fibers. And that's an integrable system for the obvious symplectic structure and also a group scheme. Uh, in general, the space was studied uh, perhaps in a different context by Bezrukavnikov, Finkelberg, and Merkovich. It's uh, probably more than 15 years since, since then. And they discovered that the correct formulation of a Tuda system, which had been implicit somehow in the literature before, but again, not, not quite spelled out, I think, since they, uh, until they, they wrote it up, is the spec of the equivariant homology of the base loop group of G. And it has, a, of course, projects to the equivariant homology of a point, which are the uh, adjoint orbits in the Lie algebra. And they show that some uh, algebraic symplectic manifold, and this, uh, this projection defines, again, an integrable system. Um, and an abelian group structure. And uh, in fact, what, what used to be called a TODA system embeds an open dense subset inside. I think uh, in a later paper, they studied that. TC, uh, which TC is TC check also. Embeds an open dense set. And the restriction of the projection to this used to be studied as a TODA system explicitly. But in fact, if you complete it this way, you get a group fiberwise an abelian group scheme over the base, so isn't much better. And nowadays we call this space the Coulomb branch, although physicists just told me off fairly recently that we should be calling this the chiral ring. Uh, what is called the Coulomb branch includes a hyperkähler metric on these spaces. And uh, this description doesn't see the metric. Another description does. And in the cases of general Coulomb branches, I believe, correct me if I'm wrong, that it's still an open question to construct the hyperkeller or hyper something, hyper Poisson structure on the Coulomb branches. Uh, actually, one of the open questions I like to flag is what does a hyperkeller structure buy us? Everything I will tell you depends on the holomorphic symplectic structure, Poisson structure, and there's a long history of that. So all the applications of, of uh, uh, hyperkähler constructions that, that I know in representation theory and math tend to pick a complex structure and use that. So we can ask, uh, what have hyperkähler metrics ever done for us? I guess that's a, a, I'd love to know an answer of what more we can learn. All right, let me draw a picture of this system. So the torus case, we have a total space of a cotangent bundle, which for some reason I call Z. We have the fiber over zero, the zero section T check, and we have a section of the integrable system, the unit section of the, for the group law multiplication long T. And something similar happens in the non abelian case. The special fiber over zero can be identified the spec of a non equivariant homology. That's what happens in a, you know, when you specialize from the spec of the equivariant homology to zero fiber. There is a unit section as before, and there's a group, group structure along the fiber. The group structure comes from the multiplication omega g, the Pontragon multiplication. Um, so what I want to do in this talk is, first of all, explain this green line, the unit section. There's more to it than meets the eye. In fact, there's so much of it that you, you can reconstruct this to total space Z from it, but I have to, uh, I need a bit of license to do that, but I can explain the license after the fact. Uh, and then I want to say what, how you can change it to get the Coulomb branches for rep with representation by adding what physicists have been telling us about the gauge linear sigma model for a long time. And I probably won't have time for the open question in my sense, uh, based on what, uh, where we are. All right. So let me start what's going to be the model. I I'm calling it the oldest example of three-dimensional mirror symmetry. It's gauge theory for a finite group F. 
Um, it's a bit of a joke because, uh, of course, A model and B model and everything is the same at that, at this stage. So somehow anything you might want to call mirror symmetry must happen in the same place. But nevertheless, something interesting does happen, which you can which we can learn from. But it's uh, you can't take it too seriously. Uh, by the way, the name for that, the more common name for that, is electromagnetic duality. Right. And what it says is that the, there are two tensor categories which are Morita equivalent, constructed from F. One is vector bundle, F graded vector spaces or vector bundles on F with a convolution tensor product. Oh, that's not the, that's not the marker. No. With a convolution product. And the other one is the category of representation of the tensor product. And these are Morita equivalent as tensor categories with a bimodule being your, in both cases, a fiber functor vector. Uh, how is that possible, you say, that you could see everything just from this? Well, because you put all the information in the commutation data between these two, uh, these two actions, namely the commutation data tells you that the group element acts on the representation. So that's why it contains the information. So let's make it more complicated. Let's Z be the Drinfeld center of either of these. They are, of course, isomorphic because uh, the Morita equivalent. So we have this diagram. No, oh, should have been pink in my convention. All right, I didn't make it pink. So we have the center mapping centrally to representations or to vector f f vector spaces, and uh, uh, then mapping further by the fiber functor of vec in a compatible way. And moreover, there's a little calculation you can do to show there's a tensor category, a tensor product of these two is in fact vec. So. If you didn't know that you discover it this way. So if you draw a picture, what you'd be drawing here is, well, maybe spec of the center here, this is gray Z, and then two Lagrangians for the two halves, intersecting at a point that's your vec. And the interesting thing, I think, so while well, to wrap your head around that, is that these two, green and orange are equivalent as the algebra categories. And how could they be at the same time isomorphic and transverse, you ask? Well, they're not isomorphic as the module categories. And interesting in this world, the point, intersection point gives the isomorphism between them. It's more like a duality. Yeah, so uh, except for the bizarre fact that two transverse Lagrange, it may seem strange that you a point who gives an isomorphism, but because some of these things are very local, if you really want to think of a speck of this, everything would be a point and it's some internal structure. Um, so when we try, uh, I'm going to do that next for, a, for the Lie group G. And actually the Lie group doesn't cause any trouble. For a compact Lie group, it almost worked and uh, things are a bit more infinite. What's causing trouble is the Lie algebra. In topological representations, uh, we're talking about representations of topological actions. I could have written that earlier. One inter possible interpretation is the action of the quotient group G mod the formal, sub formal group at the unit, which is a normal subgroup, or mod the Lie algebra. And this is modding out by the Lie algebra that's causing the trouble, or, or D makes it interesting, rather. So I'm not going to go through details, but that's the analog of the electromagnetic duality above for uh, a vector space. When f is a vector space, which would be the Lie algebra of the group. So you're dividing by it. So you want to look at BG hat as a group that literally only works if G is a billion, right? But uh, some, in spite of that, a lot of the algebra when you're dealing with this object, G more G hat, works as if G hat could be the loop twice, as if there was a B2 of G hat. So it literally, it's only, it's only true for, for the torus. And this is a duality in this case, and you are getting two even uh, symplectic manifolds or two transverse Lagrangians inside, F plus F star. In both cases, the, the uh, Drinfeld center will be a very tensor category of coherent sheaves over F plus F star, but the two tensor categories correspond to transverse Lagrangians. But now these are actual 
spec of those are genuine spaces, they're not just points. So what happens, the analogous equivalence here is only equivalence for localizations at the intersection point and doesn't know anything about what happened far, far away. Okay, so what I like to want to explain next is a good understanding of, well, not uh, having, having drawn this with colors, that's the advantage. I can go back to the TODA system and you kind of guess what's going on. This is going to be the analog of vector of G mod G hat, local system with convolution, and green is going to correspond to rep of G mod G hat. And to spell it out, to see how that is rep of G mod G hat, we have to find the model for G mod G hat, which brings up the Lie algebra in its uh, even form, like this. And the, again, I didn't walk you through this, but there's a causal duality involved in the interpretation to turn an odd space, the algebra degree minus one to an even space. So if you do the causal duality, you get what I call the curved Cartan complex. And that's a cross product of G acting on, uh, on its uh, Lie algebra or the polynomials in G star with a superpotential. The superpotential is, if you, it's easier to exponentiate and then it's just the exponential map from the Lie algebra to the group. And the superpotential is the causal dual of the action of G hat on G. It's a little calculation. And modules over this guy form a tensor category. It's a bit unusual. Usually when you put a super potential, we don't get a tensor category anymore. Uh, but in this case you do because the group, uh, because the algebra law here is, is convolution, not pointwise multiplication of functions. And that is our model for representation of G mod G hat. And from an algebra with G mod G hat action, you can build a co-invariant algebra by uh, sneaking that into this curved Cartan complex, so letting G act on that too, and writing the curved Cartan, so no differential, curvature, plus additional terms which are encoded by the action of the group on A. And here's uh, roughly where the data comes from. Actually, it's more, not roughly, it's exactly where the data comes from. The action of the group infinitesimally is a Lie algebra homomorphism from the Lie algebra to the uh, Hochschild co-cycles, that should be HZ1, but I'm going to write HZ odd. And the action has to be trivialized and that's a map from G, the algebra, abelian Lie algebra G oops, to HG and that should be even, not just zero, or the a priori it's zero. And the reason I'm switching, it, it should be one and zero if we insist on a Z graded world, but as we'll see, physics is Zemo two graded, so you abandon everything except parity. This is supposed to be a DGLA map, this here. But actually, it should be an L infinity map in general. An L infinity map means that I is not necessarily a linear function. So I non linear, it could be non linear. So it's a function on the Lie algebra with values in even Hochschild cohomology. And what that stands, what that represents with the qualification that I won't have time to explain is a deformation parameterized by the base G mod G. So if you start with the algebra A at put it at a point zero and you want to extend it around, you have some deformation data telling you how to do it. That's part of the action. And here are three examples quickly just to show it makes sense. I don't want to get the details about that. I want, just want to point out that there is a strict model where you can, of, for rep of G mod G hat, you can calculate things. The first example, you know, with the different guys, take uh, the circle and let it act trivially on the algebra. So L is trivial. I could write here, oops. L is zero here. So the only information is in the trivialization. And that's a map from C psi to, uh, to the Hochschild uh, cohomology of A, it's the center of A. And what you get here is, well, sum over weights from the group law of polynomials in A, so A spread out of the Lie algebra, 
with a super potential. This part comes from, from W naught. So I could write that. And this part is new. I guess I've assumed it's linear in tau. It needn't have been, but, but in this example, let's put it, make it linear in tau. And actually, if you think what the role tau has is to fix the gradings so as superpotential has degree two. But um, if you care about the gradings, if you localize this away from zero, you're going to get exactly the category of matrix factorizations uh, for A with superpotential psi. And that gives you the interpretation of matrix factorization as invariance, uh, modular co-invariance for the BZ act for a BZ action on A. This is due, I should probably put the name down to Tony Pregel. And actually, I think his name starts with an A. So that's, that's an old example. Uh, there is something to notice, we will come back, which is that actually I had just set n equals zero. And if you put, if you include non zero values of n, something could conceivably happen. And, and it will later. Second example, take the algebra U of G, so the category of Lie algebra modules, G acts by conjugation, that's trivialized by the inclusion of G inside U of G. The, the complex you get has, uh, well, S of G star times U of G with a non-degenerate quadratic form on it, even though it's U of G is non-abelian, that's enough to kill the everything inside here, or not kill it, make it equivalent to vect, the point, and you get the category rep G as a rep G mod G hat module. Everything here will be a rep G mod G hat module. And if you want an explanation for that, as for sanity check, you can think of U of G modules or representation of G hat as the G hat fixed points on the category of vector spaces. So if you continue to take G mod G hat fixed points, you get G fixed points, which is rep G, of course. So it checks out, it gives what it's supposed to. So far, we're happy. There's another example, quantum BRST reduction. We'll skip that. And here's the, the model theorem here. And that explains the, this connection between the TODA system and gauge theory. The Drinfeld center of the curved Cartan complex is a Bray tensor category of coherent sheets on the TODA space. So going back. This really is the center of the green thing. When the green thing is done properly, in not just functions on the line, but enriched, this enriched structure in the curved Cartan complex. So it replicates what happens in the final loop case. It's a moral theorem because it's not actually true, at least in any set of consistent definition that you want. There's a reason for that. The real theorem is that you get the completion at the unit section. So it already says something slightly non-trivial around zero in the non-abelian case. But here's the moral proof. Well, let's compute the fiber over a point in the, in the green section. Let's, let's see what we're generating in the fiber when we're computing the Rinfeld center. And this is what we're computing. Let's not justify that. And there's a little yoga with, uh, if you have enough faith, where you end up with a calculation of, Vec tensor over rep h, rep h hat. And these are vector bands on h mod h hat, which are local systems on h. And the monodromy representation identifies that exactly with the modules over the Toda fiber over that point. If you do an honest calculation in any usual setting, you'll see that's not quite what happens. Let's take the abelian case. Then uh, T doesn't act on the Lie algebra. So we just get the tensor category of representations of. Uh, of T, so just sum over the weights, the tensor product being the sum of copies of the Lie algebra. And the superpotential is linear on each, on each sheet. So the only surviving sheet has lambda weight, lambda equals to zero, everything else dies. This, this has no critical points. So the Rinfeld center is just the completion at zero of the cotangent space, which is also a completion at zero inside the total system. But you've lost somehow, You've lost the fiber and the fact that it was periodic. So I should point out there is a framework for uncompleting the calculation. I gave a talk at the JMM a couple of days ago. However, be dishonest to invoke it here because in that framework, 
the only way I can make it work is by starting with the total space and then uncomplete calculations make sense. So I couldn't logically use that to construct the total space this way. I think the cartoon calculation here is a evidence that that's the correct thing to use. All right, come on, I'm going faster than I thought in this one. All right, so now let's go to Coulomb branches. And uh, it's going to get interesting, especially since I didn't get quite as far with, uh, with the calculations as I was hoping to. Um, but then I'm also not as good looking as I'd like to be, and I learned to live with that too, so we'll have to proceed anyway. Uh, the Coulomb branches. Now, physicists tell us that if you add matter fields coming from a quaternionic representation of G, there should be a three-dimensional theory, which should be something like the cross product of G with some categorical thing, a highly categorified version of the Heisenberg algebra on, on E, maybe, generating a 3D theory, categorified enough for that. And going with that, there should be a Coulomb branch modifying the total system. And that should be a mirror to this slightly mystery theory. The mystery theory, by the way, is meant to be something like a holomorphic G gauge, holomorphic Foucault theory of the space E, I forget the space E, or some people call it the Futter theory, because the top dimensional invariant should involve the Futter equation. Uh, in the polarized case, I can be a more, bit more precise, but I would have to say it's an ansatz so justified after the fact. Uh, what this should be, this, this mystery algebra, should be the tensor category of endofunctors on the Foucault category of V. And you see very quickly there's something to think about because if you just say Foucault category of V, you're not going to see anything there. It kind of evaporates into nothingness. Uh, it only exists when you make it G equivariant. So there will be something there, but it's not so easy to work out what. I should also say that when E is not polarized, if we don't have this splitting, don't have a half, I don't know a geometric interpretation of an obvious geometric interpretation, meaning other than what, what we're guessing from physics based on their three-dimensional theory. But there's an almost uniform description in terms of the B model from the TODA system. And that's what I'd like to spell out now. And I have a speculative or suggested, well, it's a theorem which says that it works. And, but much more difficult than the theorem is the explaining why it works. And that's where I have a speculative explanation. So my goal next is to recall the Coulomb branches and state what's true about them, then explain how you could have reverse engineered all that from the just from a Toda system and a gauge linear sigma model. That's the goal. And I think it brings up some interesting points. So to have a theorem, I, I think while, while preparing this talk, I finally, after many years, understood the difference between the mathematics theorem and the physics theorem. In the mathematics theorem, there are, there's a, you say left-hand side is equal or isomorphic to right-hand side, and left and right have been independently defined or constructed. In physics, we'll say that left-hand side is equal to right-hand side, but only one of the sides have been defined. The other has not been defined. So, so in order to stay in math, I have to have a right-hand side. I have to have some definition of this independent from what I'm saying. And I'm going to use in the polarized case, I'm going to use the construction from several, five or six years ago, from, by Braverman, Finkelberg, and Nakajima. And in the non-polarized case, there's a topological tweak of that construction, which I, I believe I talked about it some time ago, or I meant to, maybe I never got to it. Sadly, it's the, I still haven't uh, written it out. Um, but it, it's very similar with just a little change. Um, there is a more recent paper by Braverman collaborators giving a construction by different methods. And I have not the chance to, had the chance to compare with that. So I think this, uh, this is a um, consistent set of definitions of a Coulomb branch polarized or not in here that I'll be relying on. This one is publicly known. The other one I've just claimed in various places, but it works, it really does work. 
Okay. So I won't recall the construction now. So I won't recall this and not explain that. I'll just accept that there is a definition. Okay, so here's a theorem. So you fix your G and your quaternionic representation. Then there are algebraic Poisson spaces, C3 and four. So, so three goes with cohomology or homology and four goes with K homology are also with loop groups. I know I haven't talked about loop groups, but uh, I probably sh should, but that's going too far. So far, I really only discussed this. Uh, that's a finite difference to the system, by the way, and that, that also goes back to, to, to given talent uh, and uh, maybe Lee, I think it was. All right, so there are algebraic Poisson spaces which are affine and flat, in fact, free as modules over the Toda basis. So when E is zero, it is the Toda system, the total space of the Toda integrable system. Uh, they're all birational to each other. Uh, they're all, the, the fibers are Lagrangian, I should have said that. There are compatible multiplications. You can multiply two spaces into the one for the direct sum of representations. Somehow this, uh, what you're building from E is something multiplicative. So it converts, it converts uh, addition to multiplication. Um, and here's the construction from the B model. So I could call that, I should, I should in fact call it a B model construction. It's the B. So, the Coulomb branch arises by gluing two copies of the basic or the Toda space by a vertical shift by a rational Lagrangian section. Rational means has singularities and indeterminacies, and that's what that makes things happen. I'll spell out the condition later. So, in other words, you take somewhere a drawing, you take, you take one copy, then you shift by a rational section, which Let's see, take a shifted copy. I'm drawing it a bit off because it's a rational section. So it moves some parts of the space outside the space. And C of G is the gluing of these two affinized. So maybe I should say, and affinizing I here, and affinizing, I'm gluing two copies, and affinizing at the end of that. I mean, it's, uh, it's still an open question of which I don't have a clear understanding if there is a refinement of his affinization that will produce gradient tensor categories. But this is meant to be the Dwinfeld center of the, of the associated EQFT. So, so I, do you get the correct Dwinfeld center from this or not? That's not completely obvious to me. I think I don't understand the TQFT well enough. All right. Moreover, the section is something that was known in physics a long time ago. It's the exponential of the differential of the superpotential for the gauge in your sigma model. So this is a GLSM superpotential for the representation V for half of V. And there are trace of the function psi log psi minus one and of a dialogarithm in the missing a parenthesis in the in the k theoretic case and i should say that this is uh this is a sterling um is that these are the sterling asymptotics of the gamma function of log of the gamma function the sterling which is meaningful and same for a Q gamma function, in Jackson Q gamma. Q gamma function. All right. I mean, so in other words, the construction just from the total system and the superpotential of GLSM. And finally, it's an abelianization theorem, uh, which is, uh, I think it's, it's a little bit mysterious. 
you can deduce it from from what's above it says that if e contains a copy of the adjoint representation then if you take it out restrict to the torus and divide by the vial group you get the same thing so in other words you can describe the non-abelian coulomb branch of the abelian one in cohomology, it's even better. Don't even need the adjoint to be inside. Just need E to be a little big. Uh, I think you're essentially ruling out only the fundamental represent the doubles of fundamental representations, and everything else works. And because of flatness, that just means that you can compute for SL two, and for SL two, it's only exactly one computation you ever need to do SL two under standard representation, and then you know all the Coulomb branches. So a couple of complementary remarks. So first of all, nobody yelled at me. I think they should, they should have. Uh, in general, if E is not polarized, the construction of this space could be obstructed. There will be a sign problem. The obstruction is the class W4 modulus in H4 of BG. Modulus squares from H2. And in the K3 version, the secondary obstruction is possible. I believe they don't exist for connected groups, but I haven't ruled out these connected groups. It's, uh, I got tired of thin node squares at, at some point. Um, uh, so let's reformulate a bit uh, this thing about this gluing two copies here by a vertical shift, because I think this, this idea requires explanation. Uh, you could say differently the functions on the Coulomb branch of the representation added. There are sub ring of functions on the total space, and the sub ring of those functions survive a translation by this. They remain regular. And this, this has poles. I mean, that's a con vanishing condition around some local. Um, all right, so I said somewhere condition needed, which I didn't state. For this to be true, one of two things must happen. Either G contains a circle in which the representation of V has positive weights, strictly positive, or else need to add a mass parameter. And then you can, at the end, you can specialize to zero. And the final thing I said is that, well, this construction works for non-polarized representation, but how could it? Because here I'm using a polar half. Well, you don't have a polar half, but if you restrict to a regular element the Lie algebra and you keep the positive way half of E, well, there's a half. Uh, and uh, you can use that, it turns out, for the same effect. Uh, what's in curious about that is that there doesn't seem to be a geometric origin to this. In other words, what does a half do? Well, this half is meant, this V is meant to be a boundary theory for the theory with matter. When E doesn't have a linear Lagrange and there's no obvious candidate for it. There is once you break the symmetry a bit and strangely enough, that seems to suffice, but that, that I, I don't have a good explanation for. Okay, remark, that's what I was almost got when time ran. So as a formula for these sides more explicit, uh, I think I can write it. It's a sum over, and now I have to start writing, sum over weights, weights new of V, not of E, of uh, new times uh, log uh, new applied to Xi. So I should have said, that's what happens, takes a lot longer to write, this side, the element, C in the Lie algebra is this. And of course, because of the log, it's multi-valued. So actually, this superpotential that the physicists were telling us about for the gauge near sigma model doesn't make sense. This derivative is multi-valued. Well, that's why the total system comes to the rescue because you're exponentiating it. And when you're exponentiating it, of course, the ambiguities disappear. So it's single value as a section of a TODA system. Uh, 
Um, if you ask uh, what what happens in uh, in uh, E instead of B, so you don't have this thing. Well, you choose the positive way. So choose you choose a vector somewhere in the dominant chain, regular vector, a regular element psi, and choose the positive weights for that, and write the formula just for those weights. And it all looks good until you ask, well, did you? Does it change if you change the vial chain? Because after all, it has to be defined the total space which divides by the vial group. And the answer is there's a sign problem. If you, a potential sign problem when you reflect. And that's where the anomaly comes from. So X of this would not be well-defined in the anomalous case. All right, so. So what I would like to what I would like to claim. So what would explain? So I think I'm done with maybe I'm done with a statement, and there follows speculative interpretation. I mean I think it's interesting, but so are there any questions so far before I? So maybe I'll draw a line. And uh, I, I can write maybe just to illustrate X of there's a log indicator decays X of D psi of an element G, I think is the product again over weights, weights new of V again. Uh, I think it's, oh, what is the formula? I think it's one minus, G to the power nu. So this is an element in D check. Exponential of something of a, of a weight. But it's also a single value is a point. All right, so yes, well, Okay, so the normal question, let me move on to speculation. What would explain this B model construction? So what's a scheme of things here? So a scheme of things, So X the smooth manifold. You have the tensor category of coherent sheaves on X. That's our tensor category. Is the Rinfeld center? Uh, it's a braid tensor category of sheaves on the cotangent bundle. But actually, if if you use any honest definition, you just see the zero sections on the cotangent bundle. So maybe not explain how. The uncompleted, if you don't have any other information, the uncompleted infrared center is a Brady tensor category of, I should have been derived, I guess, derived category of coherent sheaves on T star X. Okay. So that seems to be something like a Coulomb branch, I think. And that's the analog, at least in the Toda space. X would have been the Toda base. In the Toda case, we have a reason to periodicize the fibers, right? If you don't know where it came from, we may not have. And now what are we doing? We're adding a superpotential. And you would like to construct now, first of all, what's the boundary condition, the matrix factorization category of X with respect to W. And then end over X, the tensor category of mx of x respect to w. And you want to ask what's the Greenfeld center of that? What is the center of that? And based on exper empirical evidence, If W is regular everywhere, it's the same cotangent bundle. Well, 
Whereas if W has singularities, you want to see something, something changes. Some, there's, a, there's a change at the singularity. You want to say that it's the subring of functions on T star would survive translation by the W. So it's spec. Vertical shift, shift vertical translation by the W. And this actually is saying something because uh, if it's X, this is the cotangent fiber, you think at first, well, the matrix factorization category, so let's draw the graph some, some color. Oh, not good. Um, let's draw the graph in some other color. Ah, even worse. All right, the graph of the W. The usual picture is that the matrix factorization is supported just at the intersection points with X. So what happens that infinity should have no relevance at all, but actually, if you, if you do a calculation in the simplest case, you are changing the space even on the zero section of X. So even if you do homological algebra and you say, don't care about what happens far out, this somehow, the singularities of W are supposed to enforce a change in your X. So you can take an example, I mean, very, very easy example. So example is W is log X. So, and you get, let's say, functions on T star X are given by X variable X and Y. And then you get uh, polynomials in, so Y must survive, trans, fun, these functions must now survive translation by, of y by one over x. So you get functions of x and x, y. And there it is a polynomial ring, but the Poisson structure is not the one you thought. So, so something has changed. All right, so what is the we're after? Well, we're after this guy here. And what, what is it? Well, so here's the problem. First of all, the usual calculation of uh, considering the category near just the, the matrix factorization category just at the zero section is kind of incorrect. What the, the, the picture of what you should be doing was explained to us by Kapustin Rosansky, at least conjecturally. Conjecture, what they explain is that, well, there's this object the tensor category of coherent chips on X that sit lives on the zero section. There's the object of coherent chip, tensor category of coherent chips on gamma that lives on gamma. And all we're, all we're computing here was the home, some home between these two things. But when you want the endomorphism or matrix factorization category here, you really would like to discover uh, not something supported there, but you'd like to discover the tensor category of coherent chips on gamma. So this should be the coherent chips on gamma, gamma of the W. I, the tensor product. And now you want to modify the theory which was living over X to be a theory over here. Well, it's pretty clear what happens when gamma goes to infinity, you have nothing over X or missing some part of X. You're missing the divide, the, local, the singular locus of W. So singular locus of W is missing. And it's missing for a good reason. One way to see, honestly see it without invoking some mythology, by the way, so this can be made, there's at least one way of making it precise enough that these calculations make sense. Uh, but, uh, but let's not, we don't even need to invoke that. Uh, uh, what we need to do is to think of W as deforming uh, 
the case W equals zero, the category of coherent sheaves. So think of W as a deformation. So looking at C of X, Y and epsilon and the superpotential epsilon is a parameter and superpotential is uh, epsilon over X. So when you draw that, this is your X, I should have drawn this nice picture in advance. So maybe epsilon goes this way. And we're doing this in green. Well, away from epsilon is zero. The graph of the superpotential is something like this, right, the hyperbola. But what happens at zero, you get these two axes. The key point is being, you do not get just a zero section. So the closure of, of graph of DW at uh, epsilon is zero includes verticals over the singularity norm of the singularity actually. So what is being computed here is not a deformation of the coherent sheaves on X, but the deformation of something which also has singularities vertically. And I think there are different ways to interpret that, but one obvious interpretation is that you are deforming, deforming uh, coherent shapes on X minus the singular law minus singular locus. So deforming things with poles. So well, if that's what you wanted, that's fine. But if you want to deform things on X, you should not be doing that. You want to be getting rid of this line here. And the way to get rid of this line is to change your space. That's, that was a mistake. Change your space to keep the functions that remain regular under the W translation, in which case you do produce a deformation of the category OX. So the, the key here, I think, uh, physicists probably know what they're doing in a different way, but mathematically to understand that, the key thing is to understand what we're trying to define when we're defining this. So what are we defining? So what does, in our case, G, semi-direct product and uh, endomorphism of the Bukaya category of B mean. So that's an algebra object inside G categories. It's a very simple algebra object. Uh, it has the type uh, form, let's say V tensor V check with the obvious algebra structure coming from contraction, the dual. And what are modules over it now? Our objects X such that you get a map from V, v, well, v tensor V check and sir X back to X. And so the identity mapping here gives you the identity. And if you think about that, if you think of X as what they are in the B picture, Lagrangians on uh, inside the total space, well, you'll see that the only way you can have that is if your Lagrangian lives away from the singularities of, of uh, your section V. So it only works as is avoiding the singular locus of V. Of, of C actually, I don't know why I call it W now. It used to be called C. C. I changed my mind at some point. Or else you simply know the categories of sheaves you're creating poles by going, sending it off to infinity and bringing it back you're creating poles. So the only way to avoid that is to look at objects which are still controlled at infinity and as long as singular locus on V. So the, uh, the set of things that remain finite if you're not willing to restrict yourself to avoid the singular locus on V is you have to impose conditions at infinity 
on objects along the singularities of C. And it means what the new objects we should be looking at should be pairs X and Y with isomorphisms. Uh, uh, I think V check, I think V, v check tensor X to Y and V tensor Y back to X. wherever possible, wherever the total system detects. And if you think about what you're describing, you're describing exactly things that live over the Coulomb branch obtained from gluing two copies of the system. So when you speculate, a speculative interpretation of why something very naive on the B side seems to produce the right answer, because the alternative definitions of the right answer are otherwise very complicated. Uh, anyway, I think my time is up and uh, I've also run out of things to say, uh, so. Again, thank you very much for listening. Thank you very much. So is there any question or comment? So no question? Oh, okay. Uh uh, I... Quote Ed witness, Ed witness similar conference. I will take it as a sign. Everything was crystal clear. <laughs> thank you again. Yeah, thank you very much for wonderful talk, and uh, let's thanks to the speaker for his wonderful talk. Okay.